And so we have to have a, a national conversation, a real one, a real one this time, bipartisan, cross sector, about where we, what, what environment we're creating for our young people, what what investments we're going to do for the next generation. Be embraceive of all post secondary success opportunities. There are a lot of ways to get what you want. Close that trust gap, and they'll start to believe again. Like you know, this American dream thing is is you know what, yeah, it's working out for me. Welcome to the Opportunities Accelerators, the show where professionals at any stage can learn how to level up their career from those that have found success and have the scars to prove it. Our goal for this show is to provide business mentorship and maybe some inspiration in a podcast, but we also touch on other topics in the tech industry, in particular, how we can close the tech skills gap in the United States by creating more and better pathways to advanced tech careers. Opportunity Accelerators is brought to you by Skillstorm, the pioneers of and leaders in tech force by design. Skillstorm custom designs, builds, and deploys cohesive US-based tech teams at scale for our enterprise and government clients who are some of the largest and most prestigious firms in the world. And I am Vince Verga, along with my friends, co-hosts, and business partners, the man who puts the awesome in Aussie, Justin Vianello. Thank you, Vince. Thank you. And uh, the man who put the end in legend, the legend from <laughs> Liverpool, Joe Mitchell. What's going on, gentlemen? How's it going? going? Good. Justin, I noticed you had a different sweater on earlier. It was that the other day that I saw no, that video. It was the other day. This has been on all day. I didn't know if you kept was, a wardrobe change in your office for special no, but, occasions. No, but Joe does. I can tell you um, it's a little scary in his office when he's getting ready for this podcast. Does yeah, he have a staff I, I have just on yesterday thinking we had a podcast yesterday. And it was to put it back it's been worrying. Are, are, you suggesting the, are you suggesting to the audience that you wore that shirt two days in a row? <laughs> you should have just said you, Joe, you should have said you got two. You blew it, buddy. Box of them. Oh, yes, we have a guest today. So why don't, yes, we, introduce, oh. why don't we introduce our guest? Justin, take it away. All right. Welcome, Cordell Carter. Cordell, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> In terms of Cordell's background, <clears throat> Cordell is described as a belonging evangelist. He has spent much of his 20-year career advocating for belonging for all those looking for an opportunity to thrive. He is currently the executive director of the Aspen Institute Socrates program and is the founding director of the Aspen Institute's project for belonging. Cordell is the founder of the Festival of Diaspora, connecting diasporic communities across the Americas. Previously, Cordell held leadership roles with other notable organizations, including the Bull and Melinda Gates Foundation and IBM, as well as several public and private educational institutions. We are very proud to say that Cordell is a member of the Skillstorm Advisory Board and is chairman of our Upskill Together program, which we'll find out more about later. His experience in leadership has been invaluable in helping us pursue our purpose of accelerating opportunity for thousands of first-generation graduates and military veterans. It is my great pleasure, great, great, great pleasure to welcome Cordell. Welcome, Cordell. Thank you all. Thank you. It's an honor to be here all the time. I was going to say, fresh off the plane from Brazil. Yes, fresh off the plane. Welcome uh, back. It's good to be back. Yes. Uh, so, Cordell, at the beginning of every show, we like to do a little icebreaker just to get us loosened up a little bit. So today's icebreaker is going to be uh, I'm going to sing a song and you're going to tell us what that brings to mind. Are you okay. ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> Here, I got a good one for our first one. You ready? Mm -hmm. At the Copa, Copa Cabana. <laughs> what does that bring to mind? It brings back two days ago <laughs> at the Copa Cabana where I almost passed out. Uh, no, it was, it was uh, beautiful. Uh, it was challenging, but it was worth it. And that yeah. was your that was your festival, right? Festival, yeah. yeah. We had two hundred plus people there, so it was a record breaking year for us. We had you know federal leaders, state leaders, we had media. It was like we're we're growing up. We're a real organization now, and uh, this came out of just an idea, and so it just brought to mind the power of ideas and hard work. They they go hand in hand. Yes, yeah, just... since we're on the topic, why don't you kind of give a little overview of what, what the festival is all about and kind of what sure. inspired you to start it? Sure. So I think you all know that I'm, my dad is a minister. And um, as I like to joke with him when he says, you know, you're the only man in the family who doesn't want to be a minister, 
I said, well, I like brown liquor and women a little too much, Dan. He <laughs> says, so do we. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I said, no, no, seriously, I, I've never seen uh, my call as uh, a religious call. It's always been secular. Like, how do we help people? Um, you know, the, the folks I admire from the Bible stories they told us as kids were never the prophets. It was always Joseph, you know, because without Joseph, you know, Israel starves. So yeah. does Egypt. But you have to, someone has to be thinking and zooming out uh, of the superstition and get us to like, how do we get people to the next place? And so that's always been something of, of interest to me. And so when I was um, trying to figure out how do I help um my country, frankly, uh, come together. We were some really challenging times during COVID. Uh, I said, you know, what worked for us when we were kids? They, we had these big old tent revivals and they were a lot of fun. To us, it's like, we would say the aliens are coming because this is where people from the farms would come. And these are people that you wouldn't see. We were city folk, so we wouldn't see them often only at family reunions or funerals. And just the way they worship was different, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, strange to us, but comforting in many ways. And I wanted to evoke that same spirit, but in a secular sense, and then do it also outside of the USA, because uh, things are a little looser south of us. And so uh, we said, okay, we're going to build a secular tent revival, a celebration of ideas, music, culture, history, all of that good stuff, just to bring people together. And because in the Americas, you have really two choices. You're here by, by, by force or choice. Uh, either way, we're here. Mm -hmm. And we're our ancestors' greatest dreams, all of us, okay? And so I wanted people to embrace this positive narrative, share what they do, have fun, connect with people they never would connect with, just be this motley crew making our way across the continent and getting to know each other a little better. And to see this now, what we're four years into the process, just finished our third big convening, and to see this thing come together and just take a life of its own has been so incredibly gratifying to me. I had many moments uh, last week uh, where I'm just kind of sitting back, just watching magic happen. And um, it was it was very moving for me personally and, and motivating. I said, hey, no. the, the next step is to connect them with the skills piece, the training piece, because I think there's a lot of talent. These great leaders we're meeting across the continent. Um, if we can get them to be job ready, meaning actually learn English, in addition mm. to the technical skill they're already bringing to the table, I think we can solve part of our issues in the United States with our tech shortage. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> and I had the, the opportunity to attend the festival a couple of years ago in um, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Wait, was that the first one? That was the first one. Yeah. yeah you should was... see us now. <laughs> we had, the, they surprised me, they had the Carnival Royal Court from this year. So oh, yeah. the queen, the two princesses, and the two dukes. They, they met me in the green room at this palace where we were doing the, the closing party. And I didn't know who they were, obviously. And um, they said, we're your surprise. And I'm like, oh, my. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, and I'm like speechless. And it's like, no, this is the royal court from the carnival. You're going to march them out and they're going to dance for us. And I just, oh, wow. I couldn't believe it. So I'm, I'm dancing with the carnival queen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Wait till you see the footage on that. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. It really was. Well, it doesn't get any bigger than a uh, carnival in, um, Absolutely. in Absolutely. Brazil. Um, you actually uh, preempted the other next song I was going to sing. It was uh, Son of a Preacher Man. So, uh -huh. so I'll, I'll spare you that. But one last song and then we can get going. So uh, do, does this ring a bell, uh, Cordell? My girl, my girl, oh, yeah. my girl. Temptations. <laughs> you know, I used to sing that with my daughter. This is before you know how the, the toddlers will pretty much do anything. They're, they're not shy. She used to do the whole dance performance and everything, the spin, the blow and the kiss. And we would do performances before she started getting a little shy when she was like six or seven. But so that's that was our song, My Girl. We and you, sang, you sang it for us at our company conference. It was a oh, spring sorry. rendition. Remember the talent show? <laughs> we'll have to pull out that footage. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But that, that was my daughter's and I song. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, I sing that as well, Cordell, to my daughter. But now she's oh, yes. she just walks away. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to interview. Maybe they get a microphone. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, so, Cordell, while we're on the topic of music, so you're a trained opera singer. So I was, yes. Why <laughs> did you choose not to pursue a career in music? You know, um, number one, it's a lot of hard work. And I was so immature um, at that point where I was training. 
that I, I just knew I couldn't put the effort into it. And what did it for me, I, I had to make a choice one semester. It was probably spring of 96, whether I was going to do student government or continue with the, the university a production of, um, I believe it was Carmen. And so it was gonna take a lot of time. And um, I just remember sitting outside of the observatory and I can hear them singing. And I'm looking at people play hacky sack, cause that's how old I am, hacky sack mm -hmm. on the lawn. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm like, mm. and I'm looking up and I'm looking around, I'm looking up and looking around. And I was like, I wanna be outside. <laughs> And so I, I gave up the music scholarship there, but promised myself that I would, I would uh, keep, keep at it. A promise I haven't kept completely, um, but uh, I'm, uh, I don't regret the, uh, the training. I loved it. I mean, it's something I grew up doing. And um, in fact, I, I sang for the festival this year, um, oh, wow. the other night, something I, I don't do a lot anymore, but um I, I try not to live with regrets, and I say it's just part of the experience that makes me an interesting person. So <clears throat> your father's a pastor, you mentioned, and, and you yeah. spent a lot of time in the church. Is that where you found or refined your musical abilities? Oh, yeah. I mean, when your dad's a pastor, you are part of the show. And, and I remember, I think the first time they put me on top of a, you know what a Hammond organ is? It's a stand-up. Uh, it's made to mimic the sound of a pipe organ because it spins yeah. like that. But uh, it's actually a stand-up, like almost like a stand-up piano. And a lot of black churches have it because they're small. And so they would put me on top of it because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see me. And I would lead the choir as a four-year-old um, singing songs. And they would uh, uh, put me up all the time uh, for what we call a sermonic solo. And I just got used to being in front of adults, uh, still not embarrassed. I can do it in my sleep. And that was very normal for my sisters and I. And that's where it started. And it wasn't until high school when I um, moved to Washington State from Southern Virginia that uh, I had to do a music requirement. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. I'll do choir. I figured something easy. And it was the first time I actually had to read music and everything because, you know, we just like play my key and let's go. You know, that's how it works in a black church. And here, and I'm, I'm with a bunch of Mormons and these kids could sight read. And so I had to learn quickly. Uh, the talent alone wasn't enough. You, you actually had to have some skill too. And so um, uh, it was a very, very good experience. I got exposed to sacred music. Uh, to this day, I still listen to St. Olaf Choir. It was, we were an 80 person acapella um, choir and was very competitive wow. in Washington State at the time. And uh, some of this music just still moves me to this day. And um, I listen to it still. St. Olaf Choir they're out of uh, Minnesota, one mm -hmm. of the oldest uh, uh, college choirs we have in the U.S. And uh, just amazing music that goes back, you know, since the 1870s. Just mm -hmm. all of these Swedes and Nordics getting together, singing in the snow. Um, that's influenced American popular music. So awesome. you went from high school and then fast forward several years you you know you have a law degree from the university of notre dame what interested you in law and why didn't you pursue a career in law yeah so i i was always i was a talkative kid if you haven't noticed and uh and i uh they say you, you're probably going to be end up a lawyer because that's lawyers just talk all the time for a living i said oh it's interesting so i was intrigued by it and they started having me hang out with our church lawyer. And I would just sit in his office and look at his books. And I'm a little kid, so they would do meetings right in front of me. It didn't matter. And I was always fascinated by, um, by law as an idea, as a profession. And when I got to university, it was pretty clear to me I didn't have the temperament for a legal practice, but I still wanted the education because mm. I thought it was a good leadership degree. And so when I came to choosing law schools, um, in the year 2000, uh, sorry, 2004, I, um, I went with, an, for me, a non-traditional choice because I really fell for the marketing. Notre Dame said, we educate a different type of lawyer. And I was like, oh, I think I'm different. Uh, and we the more civically engaged. They were like, you know, we, we, they love when you become a prosecutor. They, they love judges. I mean, they really focus on, on the profession and the, as an institution. And I, I love that approach and I had a really good intellectual experience there. And, and then I had an opportunity to practice for, uh, do environmental law for one year, fresh out of law school in Germany, did a, as a Bosch fellow. And I, I took the bar while I was in law school 
and um, it was kind of a practice and I passed. I was like, okay, done. I will never take up another bar again. I've held that promise. So I wasn't <laughs> supposed to pass, but I took it. And in fact, my dean was really upset with me. She's like, you're gonna mess up our 100% bar passage rate. And I said, well, my pregnant wife just demanded that I do it just in case I pass so we can summer in France with the baby. So what would you like me to do, madam? Um, and so I took it, passed, we summered in France, continued on to Germany, came back to the US to work for Seattle Public Schools and spent uh, three years in their business and their law department working on uh, labor issues, mostly labor contracts, uh, negotiating them. Um, I was a young pup, and so I did not know what I was walking into. And I was trying to figure out why all these very seasoned people were gladly giving me these assignments. No one wants to do this stuff, okay? <laughs> um, and uh, But I'm glad I did. It was a great experience that I hope to never experience again. It was mm -hmm. fantastic in yeah. the past. <laughs> So Cordell, obviously I know your family are, uh, you know, big believers in education. We've had a lot of conversations about it. I think your daughter is about to go off to yes. college. Yeah. Yes. Um, but a lot's changed, you know, since, since we were in school and I know you've worked on some of these, you know, uh, challenges with, you know, the Gates foundation and, and obviously the Aspen Institute. Um, what, what, what is your assessment of where we are today with higher education and, you know, how do you, how do you, I mean, if, if the point of college education is to prepare people for, for, for jobs, right. And, and doing it in a way that doesn't crush them financially, you know, we're not necessarily doing a great job. So yeah. big picture wise, what are some things that, that you see that we need to change and what are some things that we can focus on that, that can do a better job of, you know, getting these people prepared to, for success in the, in the real world? Yeah, so I'll start at the highest level first, and that's just industrial policy. We, we don't really have one. Uh, we have a lot of strategies, uh, but they're, they're not tethered to anything. Um, and so I, I think one reason that we are so confused and there's an over-reliance, or I should say a, an over-dependence on traditional higher ed, is that that's what we've always done, and that has worked for the people that are in power. They, they can't conceptualize an alternate path because that's not the path that they chose. And no one thinks they're dumb. I've learned this, especially leaders. No one thinks they're dumb. No one thinks they're inadequate. And so if you parrot back their experience, parrot back their words, they're going to assume that you're brilliant. Okay? And so from an industrial policy standpoint, we don't really have one. Okay? So you chunk that down. What happened over the last, what, from the, I would say the 80s until about the 90s, we, we essentially eradicated a career in technical education. Um, we've rendered it for kids that were had behavioral problems. <laughs> Or so like what some people refer to as vocational schools. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. CTE. And so, um, and so you, you, you gut out um, what was some really good pathways for folks uh, that wanted jobs faster. And so really, if you want CTE now, your, your only option, well, your primary option is the military. Okay. Which mm. is not ideal because that has, they have a very different purpose. Right. And so, but that's your, as a great, developer of skills right now, technical skills for folks. Um, and so uh, we, we've limited options when we should have been going the opposite direction. And, and now people are like, okay, well, I've went and got this really expensive degree. I, I have a degree in underwater basket weaving and I can't get a job. There's something wrong with America. No, there's something wrong with you and the choices you made. And so what I counsel people now is like, be embraceive of all post-secondary success opportunities. There are a lot of ways to get what you want. Let's be real clear. What is it that you want to do? What type of things do you want to prepare yourself to do? Uh, if you can figure that out, I think there's a way you can do it without incurring $120,000 in loans. And so I, I want to address the cost of higher ed for a second because um, um, I'm blaming the boomers on this one. <laughs> so when, when my uh, parents, my, my parents, neither of my parents uh, went to school, uh, university like I did, um, but had they gone it, and paid state tuition, you know, it would have been in the, you know, $50, $60 a, a quarter or semester right. type of thing. It was heavily subsidized by my grandparents. Okay. Now something happened as my parents got older, they didn't want to, their generation didn't want to pay for it anymore. And so whereas the cost of physical plant for universities just kept increasing and the cost of tenure, just like lifetime employment keeps increasing. Um, and then the competitive issues, like, hey, I, I want to make sure that I'm as expensive as my peers so people won't think less of me. 
So those competitive issues, think U.S. News and World Reports, all these pressures are pushing the price up. And people are assuming I'm getting more value based on what I'm paying, and that's just not true, right? Uh, meanwhile, the, the subsidy from society has, has gone away, and we have these young people um, going off to university, doing what their parents did, and incurring incredible, like, life-defining amounts of debt. Yeah. Um, I remember being on the uh, Loan Forgiveness Committee at the University of Notre Dame and encountering fellow students that already had $200,000 in debt from undergrad before law school. And I'm like, why are you here? Like, who told you to do this again? Okay. Yeah. And so you can imagine how that impacts your life. But I'm like, we, we're the first generation now that we're, we're not going to do as well as our parents because of this, this debt. There's over a trillion dollars of debt just for, for higher education. This is clearly unsustainable. And so our options are real simple. Working directly with employers, what, let's decompose what is it you need for this, these roles, because you don't need a four-year engineering degree to, to code. You don't need a four-year engineering degree. So you need someone with that specific skill. All right, let's build that specific skill. Let's do that. Let's yep. get people that fast. You tell me exactly what readiness looks like to you. I'll, and we'll meet somewhere in the middle, and then we're going to try it out. That's, that's the education now. That's the path. Had my daughter not been interested in scientific research, there was no way on God's green and blue earth I was in her four-year institution. Yeah. There's just no reason for it, uh, not with what we know now. And so we have to have a, a national conversation, a real one, a real one this time, bipartisan, cross-sector about where we, what, what environment we're creating for our young people, what, what investments we're going to do for the next generation. Because this beautiful thing that happened with demographics in this country is that we have far more people than we anticipated. Most developing countries are decreasing the amount of the population. That's just what happens with certain wealth attainment. Uh, the millennials, I'm sorry, the Gen Xers, my generation, had far more children than anticipated. Normally, you would have 1.5. We had two and a half, 2.2 to be exact. And so there's a lot more people here. So we have much more labor, which is great. But then you have this absurd amount of debt and grave concerns about the future of higher ed. I mean, COVID mm -hmm. really exposed a lot. Like, what are you paying for exactly? Mm -hmm. If I'm sitting in my living room, why am I still paying $33,000 a semester? Well, what yeah. is, what is that? Why am I doing that? You know? know? And frankly, higher ed didn't have a good answer other mm -hmm. than that's how much it costs. And so I don't think they're a, a, a movable force because they're so powerful. Remember, the people in power went to these institutions. They're going to support these institutions. I'm merely calling for a national dialogue on embracing all post-secondary success opportunities because that is what our economy needs. If we're yeah. going to maintain our edge globally as a hegemon, we, got, we need butts and seats. Okay, right. You can't import your way out of this one. You got to love the ones that you're with. And the ones that we're with, the people here, they need other options. And frankly, these options have to be funded and supported the same way that we fund traditional higher ed. Mm -hmm. uh, to some degree more, look, we're, well, is it $400 billion a year spent on education and only $400 million spent on apprenticeships? Yeah. Um, and most of those apprenticeships are not technology-related apprenticeships. Um, the traditional trade apprenticeship. So today it's very different. And then if you look at the education system, Cordell, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. The education system hasn't really changed in a hundred years. Yeah. Many yeah. of the courses that we offer today are over a hundred years old, right? And the curriculum yeah. hasn't changed, but the outcomes have changed considerably. They've changed enormously, right? So, exactly. you know, with the data that we have and everyone talking about outcomes-based education, why the heck do we still offer dozens and dozens of courses that have absolutely terrible job outcomes for <laughs> college graduates, but are racking up these hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt? So while we can put, you know, people in seats and places, sometimes if you're guiding them in the wrong direction in the first place, because you know, at, at a young age, you're not really certain which direction to go. Mm -hmm. You know, the big brand and the aura of that university pulls you in a direction. If you're not picking 
a course that has a good employment outcome, which is what most people go to school for, right? I mean, 93% of people go to school to get a good job. Then, you know, are the universities really, you know, doing a great service to people if their ultimate goal of going there is to find a really good job once they leave? Exactly. And, you know, and, and right now you have a disincentive, right? Because people aren't not applying. They're still applying to universities. They're, they're still going because that's what we've always done. That has been the pathway to success in this country, historically speaking. Um, but it is not a sustainable pathway. Moreover, the universities have to feed themselves. So, like, they have these tenured folks that do, you know, classics one-on-one. And I was a classics minor, so I'll raise my hand here. But um, uh, making that a requirement just to make sure that tenured professor has something to teach every semester. I mean, it's just... I, I just like I, I just wonder um, what's the big objective here, and and I, I think that the other shift that has to happen, uh, and this is where higher ed becomes frankly a great place as a, as an incubator for talent development. Meaning, the professor isn't saying, "Okay, the knowledge is in my head," because we know it's not. It's, it's in these devices, right? I have more here than the entire uh, Alexandra Library. Okay, just in that little phone right there. Uh, but but be a curator of the of this experience that this person wants to have. Like, okay, young person, you know, what's the learning pathway that you're on? Okay, okay, <clears throat> well, here's some competencies along that pathway, and here's some courses that can meet the need as you lift the level up in those different paths. That's a very different approach uh, than just saying, okay, you're that's your major, and here's the requirements of the major, go for it. Uh, I, I just that that's where universities have to go if they want to stay relevant. Um, cause frankly, the, 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 bigger that organizations like Skillstorm become, and then parents like myself that are about to write six figure checks for the next four years, start to ask some questions like, look, you know, thank God I only have one kid. Uh, but had I had more, I'm like, look, are any of y'all technically inclined? Any of you? Because if you are, let's do this faster. Cause you're going to help me subsidize your brother and sister. No, I think it's a good point. Good. funny enough. <clears throat> We we're joking about this earlier. I'm doing a presentation on this. And when you talk about the cost of education, and Joe and I were talking about this a while back, uh, since 1985, it's increased by 480%. It's outstripped healthcare costs, right? So wow. when, I, when I look back on my college career, my university career, you know, I went to university to get a job, my first job. I didn't go to university to get my fifth job. I didn't go to university for this experience and, and to become a critical thinker over time. I went to university to get my first job. And I feel like often that argument that you go there for the experience, it's a very expensive experience. It's an experience that costs you a mortgage, right? Yes. And, and there's this, you, you're losing sight of the fact that the, you are going to university to get your first job, mm -hmm. to get your first opportunity, right? And to make sure you've got the ability to start your career and launch your career. And, uh, you know, exactly what you were saying. So much of that, I think, has, has been lost. Yeah, it has. And, and I, I, I think about this often. I'm sure you all do as well. Like, do we just blow it up and start over? Or is there a way of, of bringing the university to the table and saying, listen, we are all after the same thing. We can be helpful to each other. Let's figure out what that is, like what that looks like. Because um, you know that your path isn't sustainable. At some point, you're just going to blow up and you're going to have a lot more people upset with you than they are now. Um, and moreover, you're going to lose so much in brand uh, as a result. So, like, is there a way that we can be helpful to each other um, on this, this goal of getting kids to universities? This is why I love the bachelor degree plus approach, um, especially for uh, minority serving institutions. Uh, you know, you can imagine like a Miles College in, in Talagaya, Tal I think it's Talagaya. Giga, Alabama, something like that. Small, small city. Liberal arts school, Baptist, you know, church created it. Maybe a thousand students. Uh, most of these students are going off to, to be preachers. Well, how many churches can you preach? Yeah, I mean, there's just, there's an upper limit. Um, how many service shops you can get into? But what if those kids could also get an AWS certification uh, in addition to seminary? Um, that's probably a, 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 an administrator I would love to engage with when I'm having a really challenging time in my CRM. 
and I need someone to be gentle with me, but also tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, I think they need to be a little more expense, uh, expansive about how they think about the humans they're seeking to develop and recognize, like, just like I have Hall Health that does counseling for them, I can't do that. I can't teach you astronomy and help you mentally. Like, look at some of these external partners that can be helpful to the experience there that these kids are trying to have. Because the outcome of getting a job benefits everybody because we all get to take credit for it. Kodo, how much do you think of this change? Um, and I think often about, you know, the role of some of these technical apprenticeships, you know, with my kids, I've got four kids and they're all very different. Um, and this is something that I, I actively encourage in my family. Don't think you just have to go to university. You've got to be able to evaluate all options. Yeah. How much of this change do you think has to be driven by employers? I would say it's 50-50, employers and parents. Um, uh, employers can be really helpful here by explicitly welcoming it. For instance, um, rather than saying, um, I want uh, someone with a four-year degree. I, I remember I used to support Rex Tillerson when he was chair of education for a business roundtable. And he says, I give the same speech every year. I'm hiring 8,000 engineers this year. I would love it to be your son and daughter, but I don't care if it's not. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hire 8,000 engineers this year, right? <laughs> and I, I want them to say the same thing to parents. Like, I'm, I need to hire, you know, 8,000 amazing humans that can do X, I don't care how they get to learn how to do X, as long as they can do X. Mm. I think that's a game changer for, for, yeah. for families as they're making these financial decisions. And frankly, these 18 year olds are about to make life term, life changing loan decisions. Um, do I do 150 K a year to go to this Ivy or um, is there a, a more affordable option? Frankly, is there an option that will pay me to learn, learn as I, I, I earn, that'd be amazing. Um, especially first generation kids, my goodness. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I got in trouble with the Gates Foundation for saying it. I'll just say it anyway. Um, that was a long time ago, but uh, for, <laughs> we for, for first gen kids, the number one objective is a job, as a job, because there's nothing more liberating than to have that moving truck in your mom's driveway, mm -hmm. the hood. And everybody knows that you're not a criminal. A little Johnny went off and did something with some education thing. And 18 months later, his mom and him are moving. That is a statement like you wouldn't believe. But what's also a statement is when little Johnny goes off to Colgate and gets a four year degree in, in English, and he's right back there with his mom five years later. That's also a statement. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. saddled with debt. That's why he's with his mom. He has a degree on the wall. Nah. Crazy. Folks need a little something a little more than that. And so um, I would I was actually advocating for more CTE for first gen and, and arguing kind of in a backhanded way that traditional higher ed is something we that the elites can engage in. But for the next two generations, let's just get people jobs and they'll make their own decisions. Yeah, no. That was not a popular opinion, by the way. No, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Cordell, uh, like, uh, I think that's a, it's a great segue, actually. Um, you know, a university degree is not for everybody. I think we've had complete inflation creep, credential inflation creep across all jobs and everything else. And I think that pendulum is starting to swing back in the right direction. People say, no, we don't need a college degree for you to be a software engineer. Um, so with that in mind, um, you know, providing multiple pathways and accessible pathways and affordable pathways for people from all backgrounds is really important. And I know that, you know, you are known for and described as the belonging evangelist. Could you tell us a little bit about what belonging means to you? Sure. And why it's so important to you? Yeah, I just had to back up and talk a little bit about history of DEI here first. So, sure. so diversity, equity, inclusion as a concept really came about during the Nixon administration. Um, uh, once he kind of realized the power of the federal government as a procurement, as a procurer of goods and services, saying, "Whoa, you know, we're representing at that point an eighth of GDP. Now it's more like a fifth. Some would say a fourth of GDP is the government spending on goods and services." Like, I want to know who 
works for these companies. Just tell some of the demographics so that I can report that out to my voters as something that I'm doing, right? So it was never a, a requirement. But here's the thing, as you all know, when you're competing for, in a competitive process for a federal grant or an RFP from a federal government, and this top score is 100, and between 199 of the people that, well, 98 are the people that win, if you think a, responding to a question and get you an extra point, you're going to respond. In fact, if you, if you um, um, are super competitive, as most people are, you're going to make sure that these are metrics that you're given before they even ask. And that's how it started. The big defense contractor saying, hey, let's reporting out on the diversity of our employees. And so that became its own industry, its own industry. DNI just takes off, right? And so the problem with that approach, I should say, over the, the last 45 years of DNI, is that it's not tethered to anything. And so once the national consensus on um, creating more opportunity for others, especially those that have been historically underserved, uh, kind of eroded, and it comes and goes, but you know, Reagan was that big kind of death knell of the, the post-civil rights um, a consensus, uh, and then it's been eroding ever, ever since, uh, then what? You, you have political acrimony, you have all types of uh, attacks on it, you have bills changing this, and that, it's just drama, lots of drama. It, corporately, it's become a, a compliance exercise, so people... They, they hear DNI and they're like, oh gosh, it's, it's just like doing the annual ethics thing. I got to do this too, right? And so it has to be tethered to a bigger strategy. That bigger strategy is, is belonging. It's a vision. This idea that um, we should be working towards a society where we all belong and have opportunities to thrive. Now, DNI is a strategy to get us to thriving. It is not the strategy. We're welcoming other pathways to belonging and thriving. But the fact that it was kind of floating out there as its own thing, I think is problematic. I seek to tether it to belonging as the big idea. That's, this is the why of it all, belonging, right? So, okay, once we have it tethered and belonging, great, that's good. Belonging means nothing if there's no pathway to thriving. And so in my mind, you got to work on thriving first, especially with folks that are accustomed to being lied to to being dismissed, to being uh, not being trusted, to being underestimated, they you need to show them how they can thrive super fast, which goes back to my, my point of controversy when I was at the Gates Foundation. For first-generation kids, let's get them thriving as soon as possible, meaning a J-O-B. Mm -hmm. okay? If you can do that, then you can start working, your, you can close that trust gap, and they'll start to believe again. Like, you know, this American dream thing, it's, it's, you know what? Yeah, it's working out for me. It's working out for me. I, I, you know what? Perhaps you shouldn't say that about my country, guys. Okay? Because this country's been good to me. I, I took advantage of opportunities, and, and here we are. And so right now, that's an upper middle class argument. We, we can talk about these things triumphantly because the system works for us. We have to make the system work for everybody, mm. or it will stop working for us. And that's the point of it all. That's the point of belonging. That's great. And, uh, you know, Cordell, obviously, um, you know, when, when you came on the board, I believe, uh, Justin heard you giving, you know, one of these speeches about belonging and it just resonated so much with him and, and what we're, we're trying to do here and, yeah. you know, accelerated opportunity and all that. So I, you know, just like to hear from you and maybe just share with our, with our listeners, you know, why, why did you decide to, to join the, the skills storm advisory board? Um, how did it, uh, you know, tie in with, with the things that you're passionate about. And then if you could just take a couple minutes and talk to us about uh, Upskill Together and, and what we're doing sure. there. Absolutely. You know, when I, when I first met Justin uh, out in uh, Biltmore, I, I didn't know what to make of him because he's like, hey, we're doing significant work and I want to talk to you about it. And we kept missing each other to like the last 30 minutes of the day. And we found, I was like, oh my gosh, these guys are really doing it. And I came out to visit and I was like, oh, this is real. This is real. And I was most impressed by a group of very successful leaders who, frankly, um, don't have to do this. You could just keep being successful in your own lane. But clearly, when you say accelerating opportunity, you meant it for everybody. And in hearing Joe's passion about being from Liverpool and being underestimated and not having the same opportunities and still fighting hard and making it happen, how you want to make those pathways available for other people, like, that's my story, too. 
I'm a failed engineering student once I got out of music, okay? I couldn't hang in the calculus. I had to switch <laughs> economics, okay? And so I, I know inherently what it feels like to, to miss out on opportunity because of a lack of preparation. Um, I know what it's like to be underestimated. And so I saw in Skillstorm, and I should say I see in Skillstorm, an opportunity for people from that same situation to have a leg up. Now, I'm a big advocate of higher ed, I think is great. Um, I'm a bigger advocate of post-secondary success because that's the goal. Right. And what I preach to people, especially young people asking like, what, what should I do? Um, I'm saying, what is it, where are you going? Because if you're trying to get a job, a job that's gonna be a, a career, a life-sustaining wage, a family-sustaining wage, the tech sector is a way to go in this country, mm -hmm. okay? And so there's a few ways you can do that. I would not suggest in university. Why on earth would you put yourself to that gauntlet and that expense when you know exactly what it is you want? How about going to a place that's incentive to help you get there? They win when you win. No weed out courses, okay? <laughs> and so it's real that the case for, for Skillstorm is real simple to me, probably haven't been weeded out. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe, maybe you have to feel that, experience that first before you're like, okay. Uh, I need to go to a place that actually wants me to be, wants me to be successful. And so as I look at, especially minority serving institutions and where this country is going, our last majority white high school graduating class in this country is 2025. The year is 2024. Okay. So as a nation, as a competitive enterprise called a nation, we need all of our horses ready to run. We need them all ready to run or we lose space. We lose our, our, our place here. And I don't want to lose place. I want that blue passport to mean something when I travel. I need it to for my own self-protection. Right? Oh. And so I, I, I think the more you can spread opportunity like this to people, the more we can convince universities that, hey, I am not here to replace you because I don't want to carry the, the, the physical like plant costs that you do. I'm merely seeking to enhance the experience that you're already giving these kids such that they will get jobs faster. You win, I win. It is a win-win solution, I think, for folks. And so the upskill together piece to me is, is, is particularly special because you're, you're providing obviously alternate pathways for folks who don't wanna do university, but for those who are in university and they're like, you know, I don't have what I need um, or I'm not getting what I need. I, I need something else. What, what am I gonna do for my master's degree? We, we have a cheaper, more effective solution for you that's going to put you in the same place as those 65,000 computer science graduates that are, everyone's com competing for every single year. You're going to be right there, right after they're done picking which company they want to go to. They're coming to you next. Not many people can say that. And so I think that the, the gospel of upskill together is like, uh, it's certainly good news. All right. It's certainly good news. <laughs> and we just need to get on the mountaintops and spread it as, as often as possible. We need a few people to take a shot on us, specifically HBCUs, still working on it. Uh, but once they do and realize that they will not be, this is only going to enhance their bottom line, we're off to the races, off to the races. And so to that point, um, I had a conversation, uh, this is last month with the Colombian ambassador to the US. And he's really, really focused on the, the uh, Pacific coast of, of Colombia. This is where the majority of the Afro-Colombian population is. Great universities there, really high uh, English usage, but the kids feel stuck. And I said, well, um, how about you leverage your relationships with HPCUs? I'll convene everyone else and we're going to come to a solution together. I'm absolutely convinced that the next August in, mm -hmm. in Cartagena, we're going to be able to get in front of 100 HBCU presidents and make the pitch that they've been wanting to hear for a long time. And that's an upskill together. And we're going to get some contracts out of that bad boy. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Cordell, I've got a question for you. <clears throat> who, who was your mentor? So you many. Agree? Um, well, who you stands know, I, I, So I, I, uh, my formative years were before the internet. And there used to be this big tome produced every year called a who's who's guide in American uh, leadership. And I would go through it religiously, um, just a dork, you know, and um, I would identify um, people like Colin Powell and uh, uh, Robert Schnault. And while he was living, Reginald Lewis, and um, I would see what they did. And literally, I would write it down every year. Like, you know, they had asked them to suit all these different things they were associated with. 
And I tell you to a person, um, not only have I met all those folks with the exception of Reginald Lewis, because he died when I was in um, college, but I have been in the same places with them that I used to read about in the 90s because I wanted to be them. And so they didn't even know they were my mentors, but they are. They are my mentors. I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's, That's a cool story. That's a good story. Uh, well, Cordell, uh, you know, really thank you for taking the time. Most especially thank you for, uh, you know, investing your time with us on our advisory board. You made a huge impact. Uh, we got, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot yes. of bright minds with potential out there that, that I think we can help and, and help fuel the economy and obviously Lots of keep, opportunity keep pace to with the, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. 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 So now are you ready for this? It is yeah, time it is. for the famous drum roll lightning round. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Are you Strap ready? Yourself in. Say First one, favorite opera? Evita. Favorite city to visit? Barcelona. Texting or talking? Talking. Wildest cab ride location? New York. Nickname your parents used to call you? Corey. Scale of one to 10, how good a driver are you? Four. Fill in the blank. Vince Verga's sneaker collection is? Alligator skins. Invisibility or super Wait. strength? Invisibility. Do you own a bicycle? Yes. What's your favorite clothing brand? Polo. Have you ever tasted soap? Yes. How many times have you sneezed in the last seven days? 25. Is there such thing as objective beauty? Joe. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. When you fly on a plane, do you wear a neck pillow? A what? A neck pillow. No. Hmm? Which animal could you do without? An iguana or an alligator? Iguana. Yeah, I would have gone with No, iguana. they're the worst. That's it. 15 seat. <laughs> that was pretty good. You know, most people... I have to skip to the next question. You, you, you kept up, Cordell. I'm very impressed. Right, that, right. Must be our, that must be our most effective lightning round ever. You, you, you are the top performer, no doubt. We should probably have, uh, and for that, probably Cordell, have an award you, for you. I could, I How about a T-shirt? Would you questions. like an Opportunity Accelerator's T-shirt? Joe has, <laughs> Joe has one I'll share that? with you. Yeah, Joe, can you wash that before you hand it over? I used one. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> well, well, Cordell. Cordell Cord jacket. Yes. I, that's, that's coming. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. uh, well, Cordell, um, you know, thank you again. And if anybody would like to get a hold of you uh, or check out the, the work you're doing, where, where should they go? Uh, Cordell Carter II on LinkedIn. That's the best place. Excellent. Well, awesome. thank you again. And thank you, everybody, for listening and or watching Opportunity Accelerators. We'll catch you next time. This episode of Opportunity Accelerators has been brought to you by Skillstorm, where our purpose as an organization is to launch and accelerate tech careers. Please be sure to like and subscribe to catch the next episode.